Hence to the plow we're pressing on and running hard to win the prize, empowered by the love of God with grace before and grace behind. For lo, what hope before us stands, you finish all that you began. Eternal joy is in your hands and all of our tomorrows. Hallelujah. Friends, welcome to Downsview Baptist Church and our online service here, our live feed through Facebook Live. Thank you for joining us. It is our heart's intention that God would grip you with his grace, that God would surround you with his mercy, 
that God would assure you through his hope and that he would be glorified as we indeed rely upon him. He finishes all that he has begun. Listen how the Apostle Paul says that great truth in Philippians chapter 1. I thank my God, he says, in all my remembrance of you. And I remember you, folks. I'm in an empty room. I remember it being full of you and I together here. And Lord willing, soon again we will be. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine, for you making my prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. And so it's right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in my defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so you may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Join me as we entreat our Heavenly Father for our service this morning. Father God, we thank you for the blessing that it is that we know you. You have revealed yourself to us. You have done so that you might be honored and glorified in our lives. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the sweet privilege it is of being your children and of having this sweet privilege of seeking to be more like you. And so I pray for revelation this morning, dear God. I pray that you would reveal yourself to us again by your spirit, through your word, and give us eyes to see the Lord Jesus, that we might honor him all the more fully because we have been transformed just that little bit more into his image because we met with him this morning. Hear our prayer. We offer it to you today through Christ. Amen. Well, again, friends, we're glad that you've chosen to join us here at Downsview Baptist Church. We are online and only online, although the trajectory is a good one, isn't it? Hallelujah. Vaccines are being distributed. Vaccines are working. Numbers are coming down. Hospitalizations are going away. None of that as quickly as we'd like to be sure. But we have a fine trajectory, and we must give the Lord thanks for that. Until then, we are online, and here at Downsview Baptist Church, many of you will have found us through our media headquarters, our online ministry headquarters, at our website at downsviewbaptistchurch.com. At the top, you'll notice a tab that says Sunday morning live stream. Perhaps some of you have gone there and come directly to this Facebook page. If we're not live streaming, that tab will take you to a link on the Facebook page, which will bring you to our services on YouTube. Now you can also take advantage if you would like throughout the week, uh, throughout your time on our website there, there is a media tab, which will have each of our worship services on there, has our daily update videos on there, has our Wednesday evening Facebook Live and other things that we do. They're all there for you. They're categorized nicely. We're grateful for whatever it is that YouTube does to make that happen, but all of them are there on our media tab on our website. Now, if you're new to our church, and there's some of you who've come since this coronavirus has happened, and we're so grateful for that. That's part of the reason it's so difficult not to be together. But you want to have a look at our church and some details about our church, you can find that on our website. Plenty of contacts there for any questions you might have. Just encourage you to take advantage of that. I want to offer a word of thanks again this morning for your incredible generosity in supporting our ministry. We fund this ministry by what you bring in. 
you, the friends of Downsview Baptist Church, you who are the members of Downsview Baptist Church, that's how we fund and keep, as it were, the lights on here. And so you've been very generous and very faithful in your ongoing generous contributions. This past year, we made our budget, which is amazing in some ways relative to what other churches have had struggles with. But this year, we just want to continue to do that. Take advantage of mailing, e-transfer. Someone will pick up your offering if you'd like that. But just praise God for your kind, ongoing contribution to the church. Now, because we miss each other, one of the ways that technology can help us is to get together on these, not just live feeds like this. You can see me, but I can't really interact with you. And so we're going to have a chance to interact after church today on Zoom. Now, some of you are saying, don't we do that on Wednesday evenings? Yes, we have done. We're going to shift it over to noon on Sunday mornings, immediately following this church service. So the service is on Facebook Live, but we'll get together on Zoom. Now, if you look on your Facebook feed in the description of this service, you'll find a link there for Zoom. You'll also find it on an email that went out on Friday as well as yesterday for you. And so there should be every opportunity to do that. If you can't find it for some reason at noon, give me a quick text or a Facebook message or an email. And I'll try to keep uh, watching that and be able to get you on as well. But see, this is an opportunity for us to see and hear and actually interact with the church family. We've been having a great time on Wednesday evenings, but we thought, I wonder if it might be more accessible and more available if we did this on Sunday morning. So we're going to give this a try. As you know, we try some things and they work for a while. And if they stop working, we'll make a change. And we've changed our Zoom meetings from Sunday evening to Wednesday evening to now Sunday morning. And we're just trying to move around a little bit, be responsive to some of the things we hear you say. So if you've not been on Zoom, boy, if we've not seen your face for a while, we would love to <laughs> just hear your voice. Always great to see the kids and see what they're doing, how much they've grown, and just to connect with our church family. So immediately after this service, I'll go down into the office and we'll click on, on Zoom there. You'll notice the link, as I say, in the description of this video. But a month or so ago, we had the wonderful suggestion that we would use the technology we have to show pictures of our church family so that we can remember to pray for each other. Really appreciated Tatiana's idea there, and I believe it was very spirit-led, and so thank you for doing that, Tatiana. And we began that last Sunday, and again, one body in Christ here at Downsview Baptist Church. I want to ask you to pray for Vlad and Diana this week, uh, in particular with their young son, Matthew. Not easy to have children who are home and not able to go to school and this pandemic is certainly affecting children very differently. Grateful that uh, Vlad's continued to be able to work through this time, so we praise God for that. But as you keep them in your prayers, remember our buddy Johan. Johan is just so faithful. We haven't had much to hand out in this last year, and but Johan's always there with the bulletins. He's always there with a kind and, frankly, an interesting word for us. He loves history and church history in particular. So pray for him, and as well, would you pray... I pray this morning for Bonnie. Now, Bonnie's here with a few of her, her ladies. I came to the church and noticed that row of ladies that were there, Bonnie and Helen and Doreen. I knew them as Ruth's ladies because Ruth's in that row. And I got to know Ruth first at prayer meeting. And then I saw where she would sit. And there was always the same row of ladies there. Well, Bonnie has some wonderful news to share and a prayer request. Her sister has been waiting for a liver transplant for ages. And to be frank with you, the doctor said it's going to be a one in a million shot. And yet, Ruth called me just last night and said, would you pray for Bonnie's sister? Because they found a match and she schedules her surgery this week. So hallelujah and great for us as a church family to be in a position to pray for not only for Bonnie, but for her extended family as well. So for Bonnie, Vlad and Diana, and for Johan, would you join me in a word of prayer now, please? Father in heaven, thank you that we are indeed one body here in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are who we are because of Christ. We exist for Christ. And we exist that Christ might be made known, seen, and enjoyed through our lives. We bless you this morning, dear God, that as a community of faith here at Downsview Baptist Church, we have the opportunity to uplift Johan, 
Vlad and Diana and Matthew and Bonnie and even Bonnie's sister and her extended family with this great news that this transplant is on its way. I pray, dear God, that you would care for her. I pray that you would care for Bonnie's heart even as she uplifts her family. I pray, Heavenly Father, in thanksgiving for the medical care that is available and that the doctors are astounded and we recognize it's all of grace. And so for these families, dear God, we humbly ask your care for them, your direction for them, your provision on their behalf, and your equipping that they might continue to be of service for their joy and the good of us here at Downsview Baptist Church. We love them. We are glad that we have the opportunity to worship this way, at least online with them today. We pray, dear God, you will bring us again together in person soon. We humbly ask for your help that we would have the grace to wait on the Lord and find our strength renewed. We pray for Johan, for Vlad and Diana and Matthew, and for Bonnie in particular. To just that end now, we pray through Christ. Amen. Well, friends, we are going to look at the book of Philippians for a few minutes. So if you please take your copy of the scriptures and turn to Philippians chapter 4. Again, a familiar passage of scripture, but nonetheless beautiful and precious in the sight of the Lord. The Apostle Paul is writing back to this church that he helped found on the banks of a, of a river with a lady named Lydia, you remember, in Acts chapter 16, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira. The Lord opened her heart to hear the things that Paul was preaching, and a group of believers began to meet in her home. And the Apostle Paul writes back to them here in Philippians chapter 4 to encourage and to seek to strengthen them. And so Philippians Chapter 4, let me begin at verse 4 and down to verse 7. The Apostle Paul says to this church, and he says to each of us this day, rejoice. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. You know, last week we were in Psalm number two, and it spoke much about the authority that God has over his creation. And it is a precious psalm to me. And as I looked at my notes last week, I realized I had looked at this psalm before, and I certainly knew that, but I had actually preached it four years ago this Sunday here in Toronto. And it was the first Sunday of February, but it wasn't here at Downsview, was it? Pam and I didn't come and get introduced to Downsview until Easter Sunday later that year. But in February, my buddy, Pastor Brian Robinson, had come to the end of his ministry at Faith Baptist Church in Scarborough. And he and I had some mutual connections, and he asked if I would come and preach and explore a ministry partnership there. As I'm sure you can tell, I'm here, not there, and I'm very glad that we're here. Uh, glad that Pastor Osborne is there at Faith Baptist, and they have a fine fit there, and we have a fine fit here. But the thing that it reminded me of was because last night I got a haircut. My Pam cuts my hair, or at least I often cut my hair, and she trims it up. And it takes her about 37 seconds to cut this. There's not much to work with. <laughs> but at the end of each haircut, she takes a little guard off to cut the back of, back of my neck. And every time she does that, I remember what happened four years ago this Sunday with respect to a haircut. I don't know if many of you who have haircuts like this, you may not know about it unless you have hair that looks like this, but there came out an invention about 10 years ago, this round um, razor clippers that if you want a haircut like this, all you had to do was run it around your head and it was easy to do. Uh, you could take it in the shower even, it was water repellent, it was no problem at all. And I'd used it a few times. And I decided the day before I left for this potential preaching engagement, 
I should cut my hair. And as I looked at this unit, I thought, I don't know what this clear plastic rim is. And as I tried to adjust it, I thought, I wonder what it, and it just came off. And I thought, yeah, I, I don't think you need this. And I just put it to the side, and I turned it on and looked in the mirror and started to cut my hair. Yeah, I, I know, you can't fix stupid, friends. You just, <laughs> I cut a swath down almost to my scalp. I'm, I'm a day from leaving to preach at a church. Maybe, maybe that's why they, we didn't work out. But I cut this swath off my hair. I can't believe it. What had I done? I had taken the guard off. This was a guard that caused it to not go this far on my scalp, but right above it and just cut the hair as you're supposed to. When I took the guard off, I tried to do what I wanted to do myself under my understanding, do it like we said last Sunday, I did it, yep, I did it my way. And that guard was there to protect me against myself, <laughs> my own self-absorbed arrogance to try to do things the way I think I should do them. Well, you know, brothers and sisters, prayer is like a guard against us trying to do things in our own way. And when we try to do things in our own way, we make a mess. The Apostle Paul, we've just read that we're to rejoice in the Lord. We're to let our reasonableness known to everyone because the Lord is at hand and not be anxious about anything. Why, why do we get anxious? We get anxious because we try to do it on our own. We try to come up with a way that we're sure we can live this Christian life apart from the Lord. And rightly so, we get nervous. We're full of worry. We get full of anxiety because we've what? Instead of being anxious about anything, we should pray about everything. And what's the promise that comes when we pray? That when we do so with thanksgiving, making our quest known to God, the peace of God, which surpasses my understanding, my comprehension, what? Will guard your hearts. Guard your hearts and minds against my own intelligent way of doing it myself. Prayer is a wonderful guard against us making a mess when we think we're doing things properly and the right way. Brothers and sisters, I mention this to you because today we are going to not only speak about, we are going to pray together. And prayer is a wonderful guard against us trying to handle this COVID-19 crisis on our own. It's a barometer sometimes, isn't it? Our worry and our anxiety of how much we're relying on ourselves, of how much you and I are saying, look, I got this. I know what to do. We can, uh, we can handle this on our own apart from Christ. And friends, that's just not how it works. It's not required of us to understand how God's going to do things. The peace of God will guard our hearts in Christ Jesus, but the peace of God surpasses understanding. It goes beyond our comprehension. It goes beyond our understandings and our abilities to deal with things the way we think it should happen. We entrust ourselves and our ministries and the challenges in the midst of ministry, especially challenges that have to do with this COVID-19 crisis, well, we entrust them to the Lord. So today is a very special day in Feb Central. It is a day of prayer against and because of the consequences of COVID-19. Now, Feb Central, as you know, is the fellowship, the group, denomination, if you like the idea. We don't like the word denomination. We don't have any authority over each church, but we are a voluntary association, a fellowship, a shared mission together of churches. <clears throat> and our region is here in central Canada. 
which means our 300, almost, almost 300 churches, which run all the way through the entire province of Ontario and about 15 to 16 English-speaking churches in our province of Quebec. The French-speaking churches have their own unique association in Quebec. But our district, our Feb Central Association, has been calling us to do exactly this to spend a day together throughout this day, and we're going to do part of it here in our church service itself, both to pray together and model what we can do throughout the day against this horrendous pandemic that's been sweeping our nation. We're very grateful for our leadership at Feb Central. Tim Strickland here with his wife, Carol, directs the leadership development component Tom Haynes is the director of church planting, and he and his wife Tammy here are both involved in the church planting end. And the third of this trio is Bob Fleming here with his wife Rhonda. He oversees church health, the health of the local churches, the leaderships being developed for churches, and therefore the going out or sending out or planting of other churches within Feb Central. That really is the three-pronged arm of our ministry, and these leaders help us and inspire us and are led by our new regional director, Rick Buck, here with his wife Jo and their grandchildren. Rick was the pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Barrie for almost a quarter century. He's been with us for the last six, eight months, still getting his feet wet, his office organized and unpacked. But you may recall, Rick was very kind to preach for us the first Sunday of this second lockdown. It was the last Sunday of November. He was to be here. I serve on the regional board, and so that means Rick is directed by the board, and because I'm a credentialed pastor, Rick directs my, me as a pastor. And so we have this beautiful symbiotic relationship where we encourage and equip one another for the direction of our fellowship. It was at Rick's encouragement that we would spend this day in this COVID-19 crisis praying, and praying with a few things in mind in particular. Let me share just a couple of the motivations before we move into the word. Rick quotes the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1 and verse 4, where we read Nehemiah saying, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. Some days, for some days, I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. At our most recent Think Tank Zoom call, that is a time that we have at least once a month with a number of pastors across our association, our Feb Central Association. We normally have 25 to 30 gentlemen of pastors and church leaders. We had over 100 guys join this particular Think Tank about what's next. And one of the things Rick references here at our most recent think tank, we mentioned that our present opinion regarding the government's newest restrictions and lockdowns is that we as churches should be compliant yet grieved at the present circumstances. Compliant but grieved. This is certainly not God's desire that churches be kept from gathering for community and worship. The fellowship of God's people is of critical value to the church and it should never be suspended even temporarily without unrest in our hearts even as nehemiah mourned the circumstances in jerusalem which were not as god desired and entered into a season of prayer we want to encourage all of our leaders and churches to do the same to spend sunday february 7th in prayer against covid 19. Here's some of the thoughts that Rick's going to encourage us to pray. We'll do some of that in our service in a few minutes, and I want to encourage you to leave this with you throughout the day. If you check your email, friends, the same email address that I send out the daily updates to, I sent you all of these details that I'm reading here and more, so you can see the categories of prayer that you might find helpful guidelines throughout the day. He suggests this. Number one, pray for the COVID-19 crisis itself. Pray that God in his great mercy would remove this terrible virus for his glory and for our good. Pray for our medical community serving on the front lines. Pray for those who are presently ill with this virus and for families who've lost loved ones, including some within our Feb Central community. 
Pray for those impacted in so many ways by the restrictions and these lockdowns. Think of the unemployed, the poor, our children, those struggling with many mental health issues, small business owners who've been forced to close, etc. To pray specifically about that God would remove this and those who are dealing with the consequences until it's removed. Pray as well for the government. Pray for our political leaders as they make difficult decisions during this medical crisis. Pray for the salvation of those leaders who do not know the Lord, that God would use this time to draw men and women to Christ. Pray that our leaders would have wisdom to understand that churches are essential and an essential instrument that God can use in the fight against the effects of COVID-19. I want to encourage us also, he says, to pray for our churches. That in our differing conscience positions, and there are many differing conscious decisions about how to address this crisis, that we would be careful not to address or to quickly judge others' motives or intents. And that we'd show humility and grace to others, just as we have been shown grace by God. Pray that we'd continue in our churches to be on mission for the gospel, particularly in these fragile days, making the most of every opportunity and pointing people to Jesus as the only hope for our lives and for our world. As well within our churches, may we pray that we would remain committed to the priority of the fellowship and fellowshipping of God's people, even during this time, especially, I would suggest, during this time, that we're not able to meet. We can be grateful for the gifts like technology that we're currently using, but God has given us a heart to be together that we would long for the day that we could again meet face to face. And pray for your pastors. Pray for me and pray for our leaders here, the fellow shepherds of the flock at Downsview. Pray for your pastors and ministry leaders as they navigate the ever-changing restrictions and the continued responsibility to care for God's people. Friends, Rick reminds us of this. It is always a challenge to apply God's unchanging truths to difficult life situations and have everyone in agreement. It's always difficult. This is not a unique time that folks are struggling to agree and to understand and to enact the best way to go forward. It's always difficult to have everyone in agreement with the kind of challenges that we apply or that we seek to apply God's unchanging truth. This is especially true during this time of dealing with COVID-19. This is a time to encourage our people to be an example to the world and to one another. The Apostle Paul writing to the church at Rome is dealing with a diverse way that Christians apply God's unchanging principles in their everyday lives. He tells them to be careful not to take God's role as the final judge in the lives of fellow believers. And he challenges them in Romans 14, 19. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and edification. Do not destroy the work of God. Our social media accounts are a great example of a place where we need to be especially careful as we put this into practice. And so let's be particularly careful how we communicate, how we respond to each other. Even as we pray for our government leaders, so we pray for one another and leave them before the Lord, treating them with the mercy and grace that God has poured out to us. And so... On this day of prayer throughout Feb Central, I want to encourage us together as a church family to pray for three particular aspects of Christian life that are promised to us and that therefore we should pursue. That is the issue of congregational unity. That is with the motivation of patient endurance and long suffering with one another, undergirded with the ultimate motivation of love. And the way I want to approach this this morning, friends, is for us to look at a number of passages, but to look at a number of passages with each of these three issues in mind, that we would see where unity, patience, and love is demonstrated by God, by Jesus, 
Where does Jesus demonstrate a, a pursuit and a picture of unity, of patience, and of love? And then where is it articulated or called, where are we called, to pursue unity, patience, and love? Now, I'm not sure that any of you would think that's a real stretch, but it's important, brothers and sisters, that we see it in the scriptures where unity is demonstrated, where it is articulated, and frankly, how it is consecrated while we pray together. We will see where we find it. We will see where we're called to it. And then after each one, we will spend some time together to pray. And I will try to remember to let you do that as well, to be quiet. And once I get wound up in my sermon, you know I get going sometimes. But the idea is that we look at each of those areas and then we would pray for each of those areas together. We are just scratching the surface, as you can imagine, in each of these areas. But we'll spend the next 30 minutes or so expounding the text and praying together. And I hope that part of the thing we do is set an encouraging example for the rest of us throughout our day whether it's for a few moments a dozen times a day, whether it's a couple of key times that you set apart quietly, perhaps with your spouse, perhaps with your family. What a great time to bring the children around and show them where Jesus, in fact, prayed and how we should pray and what he modeled for us to pray and the kind of things that we can go before the Lord for with respect to this COVID-19. Brothers and sisters, surely we want to be a help to each other at our church. We want to help each other get through this. The trajectory is good. We have every reason to be encouraged. But boy, doing it united in Christ, patiently pursuing this and doing it with an ultimate motivation to show the love of God to others that he's shown to us, we need God's help. And so let's begin, shall we? Let's look where unity is demonstrated. Where do we see unity demonstrated? And we're going to move around a little bit, and so not all the scriptures will be on the screen. So I encourage you to take your copy of God's Word and turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 30 and following. This is, of course, where Jesus is speaking to the religious leaders, and they were not particularly happy with what he had to say. But it is where Jesus demonstrates unity within the Godhead. The kind of unity Jesus wants for us is the kind of unity that Jesus shows us between him and his Father, in particular in this passage, where Jesus tells them that his sheep will hear his voice, that he gives them eternal life, that no one will snatch them out of his hand because the Father has given them to him. So pick it up at verse 30. I and the Father are one. I and the Father are united. I and the Father are demonstrating a kind of unity. He goes on in verse 31. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It's not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man make yourself God. Well, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are God's. Verse 35 says, If he called them God's to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, how do you say of him, do you, excuse me, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming? Because I said, I am the Son of God? Verse 37, if I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But, but, if I do them, even though you don't believe me, believe the works. Jesus is saying what he did testifies to who he is. What he's showing them, what he's doing, is showing them who in fact he is in his identity. And he says it throughout verse 38. Do not believe me, but believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. The unity that we are called to is demonstrated that Jesus has just this kind of unity with his Father. I and the Father are one. 
This is the picture of unity that Jesus has, that he demonstrates for us. And so then the next question is, well, where is unity not just demonstrated, but where is it articulated? Because you may say, well, that's fine for Jesus, but are you sure we're supposed to do that? And we will look at 1 Peter chapter 3 to see this. Where is unity? Where is the call for unity articulated? Hebrews, James, Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3. Now, he has just gone through this entire uh, list here, if you will, of authority and how authority is to be used and submitted to. Back in, in chapter 2, in verse 18 and following, you have how employees are to do with employers. Even earlier than that, how the government is to be submitted to in verse chapter 2, verse 13 to 17. Husbands and wives, how they're going to deal with one another in verse 3, or chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. And so now, in light of these difficult ways to, to, to keep together on this, it says in chapter 3, verse 8, finally, all of you, families, employees, governments, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. He says there, listen, you've seen the unity that there is in the Godhead. And as you try to live out this Christian life, I want you to do it with a unity of mind. That you'd be together on this. That you'd be together on this like the Father and the Son are together on the mission that the Father has sent the Son on. <clears throat> the very kind of unity that the Father has with the Son, Peter is calling the people of God, have this, have this unity of mind amongst you. And if you notice how he connects it, the passage continues all the way through down to verse 18, having talked about this is going to be difficult. There's going to be difficulties. Part of the reason you want to be sympathetic and loving and tenderhearted and, and, and patient even with each other, this unity of mind, is because there's going to be difficulties and you should be together on this. You should be helping one another. That's the purpose of unity, not uniformity. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. They're one in person, but three in essence. They are united, but always distinct. And as we are as God's people, the call for unity is not a call that we'd be all alike. It's a call that we'd be on the same like mission. The like care we have for each other. The like desires to see God glorified. And he ties it to this very gospel issue. Look down at verse 18 of chapter 3. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. That even this call for unity is rooted in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, which the Father sent him to do. And in that mission, Jesus said, we're one. We're united. Jesus demonstrates unity. We are called to unity. And so together, brothers and sisters, let's pray for unity here at Downsview Baptist Church. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, we turn to you now with thanksgiving in our hearts for the privilege of calling you our Father and knowing that you're a God who hears. We know, dear God, that it is very difficult for us to get along in the midst of a lack of uniformity. So often, Heavenly Father, we just we don't know how we're supposed to do that. So we hang with people who are like us. We discuss things with people who believe like us. We congregate with people who think like us. We hang around people who talk like us, who have the same values that we do and live and raise their families and spend their leisure time and have the same priorities as us. Dear God, guard us from making the basis of unity, uniformity. I pray, dear God, 
that you would be pleased to show us the Father, his relationship united with his Son, and that through that, dear God, we, I pray, would be those people who at Downsview Baptist Church would find that we are together on this, that we would have one mind together, united in the same mind, the same mission, the same purpose, the same focus, that we would care for one another here at this church. We have every reason to expect that you would do that, dear God. You have promised us your spirit. You have promised us, dear God, that as we ask, you will hear us. And on the basis of Jesus' name and his authority, we ask now for what you promised we would receive when we ask in Jesus' name. So we, pr- we declare our trust and our expectation of your ongoing goodness to us now through Christ. Amen. So we have a pursuit of unity. We also have a pursuit of patience. Well, where is unity demonstrated and unity is articulated where is patience demonstrated well there's a number of places we could go but let's look at first timothy shall we first timothy chapter one see all those t books thessalonians and timothy and titus are all together just back up a few books from where you were in first peter and look at first timothy chapter one down in verse 12 because again here's a demonstration of the patience of God. We've seen God's unity demonstrated. We see the patience of God demonstrated. Paul is giving this in the form of his own testimony in verse 12. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy. Because I had acted ignorantly and in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. Verse 15 says, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason. Listen, friends, why did he receive mercy? I receive mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display or demonstrate what? His perfect, yep, patience as an example to those who were to believe on him for eternal life. So to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, to the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Patience of God towards the Apostle Paul is a demonstration of what he's about to articulate and call us to. Patience is demonstrated. Where is patience articulated? Well, just go back to 1 Thessalonians. Just back up two books. Chapter 5. To see how the Apostle Paul encourages this just straight up and clearly. We urge you, brothers... Remember, the Apostle Paul is the one who's been shown mercy so that the perfect patience of Christ might be demonstrated as an example to those who believe. And so he writes to the church at Thessalonica, chapter 5, verse 14, we urge you, brothers, those of you who have believed, we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. Now, what what kind of people are they to be patient with? Brothers, number one. The idle, the faint-hearted, and the weak. Boy, when you're trying to pursue unity, and people who don't do what needs to be done at your pace, in your way, where you've taken the guard off, and you're not prayerful about it, you're just determined to go forward, and you're feeling anxious and upset and getting frustrated because these people are not doing it the way it should be done. They're so weak in their commitment. They're so lazy and faint-hearted. They've got everything else to do, and they can't help here. They're being idle. Paul says, the pursuit of unity must be colored with the pursuit of a patient 
pursuit of unity. Jesus said, I want to demonstrate my patience with Paul. The worst of sinners. Worse than the people that drive us crazy. That are frustrating us. <coughs> Excuse me, that are discouraging to us. The Apostle Paul is saying, listen, there must be a sense that, look, wait for it. Be patient with those around you. Take the time that's required. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 14 says, a patient word can rule or break a ruler. A soft word can break a bone. Do you know that the only time in the ESV version that the word patient is used in the whole Old Covenant Scriptures is that one place in Proverbs 25? That says something to me. The last person in the world that I would expect to be patient and wait to get his way is a ruler. Kings and emperors do what they want, the way they want, when they want. Yeah, there's a, there's a little dictator, emperor, king, ruler in my heart and yours, isn't there? Think about why and how we get frustrated with other people. Patience does not end when we usually think patience ends. I'm at the end of my patience. No, no, no. You're at the beginning of it. <laughs> Patience starts as a gift from God when you can't do it anymore. It's a remedy. <clears throat> it's a pursuit of a problem, of a, of a solution to a problem of my unwillingness to let God's wisdom, but also God's timing to be at the fore of our pursuit of our Christian ministry here at, at Downsview. Think about the COVID consequences that people have been dealing with. Think of the lack of unity. What stat are you going to look up today? What news report are you going to choose to believe today? What Facebook post are you going to reference? Somebody else has got a new one. This is worth it. This is not worth it. This works. This doesn't work. Studies show... What study? The study that proves my point. Are you kidding? Of course that's the ones I'm reading. You don't have to look at CNN or Fox. You can just know in advance what they're going to say. You know what CTV television's perspective on these things are going to be. We just know it. Brothers and sisters, there's something in the midst of this COVID crisis that is driving unity to the brink as if it's just some kind of cherry on top. We'll get there one day. But I can be mad and frustrated and angry and impatient because people just don't get it. This is what should be being done. That needs to be prayed against. That needs to be prayed against, brothers and sisters, that we would be the people of God who see the demonstration of perfect patience from Christ to Paul and the articulation of the call for patience in us as we seek to pursue unity together. So let's pray, shall we, to that end. Father God, it's so easy to feel embarrassed, to, to feel ashamed, to reflect on all the justifications we have for impatience with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And all the great reasons we think we have to disobey the word of God. Dear God, I pray that you will hear our frustrations more with our frustrations than with those we are annoyed with. Change our hearts, guard our hearts. Wrap the guard around our hearts. May this kind of connection to you and dialogue with you and communication with you be a, a guard of peace around our hearts, I pray. And we believe you'll do it. The God of peace will uphold us. That passage in Philippians ends with. The God of peace will protect us. Not just your peace, but your self. Heavenly Father, I pray for help, pray for forgiveness, 
I pray for ongoing conviction and preparation and equipping against this. Now we would love to see the unity, the togetherness, the purpose of moving forward just as Christ and his Father did and that as Jesus has been patient with me, would you move me, I pray, to exercise long, it may be long and it may be suffering, but long suffering with those because you have done so towards me. We believe you'll do this. You've promised it. And so we ask it now through Christ. Amen. Well, we pursue unity. We pursue a sense of patient endurance. But we do that for the sake of love. And I know when you think, where is love demonstrated? Love is demonstrated by the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. The book of Romans, chapter 5 and verse 8, where Jesus has just moved the Apostle Paul to speak about our justification by faith. And while we were yet weak, verse 6, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, for one might scarcely die for a righteous person, but perhaps for a good person might, one might dare to die. But verse 8, but God shows, demonstrates his love in this that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. His love is on display in the cross of his son. That's where it is. And where is it articulated? It's just articulated so clear in John's gospel, isn't it? I mean, the demonstration is there. It's on the cross. It's what Jesus has done in the place of sinners. In John chapter 15, these both come together here, so I'm not running from the cross yet. You'll see it here even in, in more detail. Look at chapter 12, or chapter 15 and verse 12. Here's Jesus. Not only I'll demonstrate my love for you on the cross, and he's about to go there in John's gospel. Here we are in chapter 15 and verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Dear friends, what does this require? To love like Jesus loves means I must consider how Jesus has loved me. I must consider who it is who has loved me. I must reckon with and consider and ponder the depths of sacrificial giving that the Lord Jesus has demonstrated to a sinner like me. I've got to reckon with the reality of this sinless Son of God coming to earth taking the form of man, living the life that I ought to have lived, and then dying the cursed death that I deserved and worked for and earned and therefore should have died. And he says, when you think about loving one another, you need to do it the way I've already done it to you. That's a month of Sundays right there, isn't it? That's a, just, just a whole series what is his love like? Friends, the power to pursue unity with patience is only going to come by being connected to the love we have for Christ. Before we have love for one another, before we have any chance of showing love to others, it must be because we are relying on, rooted in, and constantly considering front burner in our face issue of how Christ has loved us. We won't do it if it's dependent upon the precious value of the people around us. No, no, we won't. I, I know you think you will, and I know I think I do. We won't. We will love others to the degree that we reckon with the love of Christ for us. Verse 13 of chapter 15 says, Greater love is no man than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. And John continues in his epistle, doesn't he? 1 John I know we're moving quickly now, but 1 John chapter 4 and verse 9. 
In this, the love of God was made manifest, was displayed, was demonstrated amongst us. See how they all come together? That God sent his only son into the world to what? To die, to live and to die. The cross is still in view. Same as Romans chapter 5, that the God, the Father had sent the son into the world that we might live through him. Our life is only as we are attached to the vine. This branch can do nothing apart from him. And so in this is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, since or if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Do you see how it's connected? My love for you, your love for me is only because it's connected to the love of Christ first for me. In fact, he says it down in verse 19, doesn't he? We love because he first loved us. And so as we're to go to prayer, listen to, listen to Jesus praying for you. For you and I to pursue patient unity, which is what the motivation for love is. Verse 20, Jesus in his high priestly prayer, he's about to go to the cross. He says to his father, I do not ask for these only, for only his disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's us. That they all may be one unity, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be in us, they're united, will be united to him, so that the world may believe that you sent me. So that their mission that's united patiently, that the love of God would be seen in their lives. That the glory that you've given me, I've given to them. That they may be one even as we are one. I and them, you and me, that they may become perfectly one. So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Patient pursuit of unity so that the love of Christ would be seen and enjoyed in this world. Let's pray together. Oh, Father in heaven, the love of God that we have for God is only because you have loved us. We simply love you and we simply love others because you are the one who initiated love. Your sacrificial determination to do us good, especially as it relates to our eternal good, that description of love, dear God, is what Christ has demonstrated for us on the cross, coming into this world to save sinners like us. Oh, dear God, forgive us for our lack of determination to patiently unite with our brothers and sisters here at this church the frustrations that we felt during this COVID time, dear God. I pray, dear God, in thanksgiving for the love that we do know because it has happened. And it's happened because you've been at work and continue to show yourself faithful among us. So encourage us in our hope that you will continue to build your church and even our lack of patient, loving endurance towards unity will not stand in the way. Let me close our service with that last verse that we began our service with. All of our tomorrows, when winter makes us reminisce of warmer days so distant now, of cherished saints the sun once kissed, whose beauty passed beyond the clouds. Let all our fond and longing tears remind us we're but pilgrims here. We trust you, sovereign of our years, with all of our tomorrows. Father, may we, I pray, pray, guard our hearts and minds by praying throughout this day that you might be pleased to eradicate this virus from this earth and that until then, dear God, you would be pleased to care for us and move us together in a loving, patient pursuit of unity so that you would be glorified all the more in our midst. We love you, Lord Jesus, because you first loved us. So we pray in Christ's name. Amen.
Friends, if you're part of our church family here, you're one of the ones that are around our church and connected to us in any way, look at the bottom of this description and we will have our Zoom connection in just a few minutes now. Thanks for your attention this morning. Cheers.